fragile, handle with prayer. Let's, let's pray. Uh, gracious God, our Father, Lord, we come to you right now, Lord, thanking you just for the opportunity to come to you today, God, and, and hear what you have to say as it relates to prayer. Uh, prayer is such a sticky subject, God. We think we know how, God, but oftentimes, God, we don't know how to go about approaching you uh, correctly with adoration, God, and thanksgiving. So right now, we just want to first say thank you. But even more than that, God, we ask, Lord, that you speak to us today, God, speak through me. Get me out of the way, Lord. Let me not focus on the waters, but focus on the task at hand. Help me to focus and hear through you, Lord, what your word says, God, so that someone can leave here today that might be on their last leg, that might be prayed out, but they might understand before we leave today that prayer still works. You're still on the throne, and you hear us when we call we're thankful for this time, God. We ask that you bless and keep us as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Fragile handle with prayer. The story is told of two old men. Grew up together, built their houses by each other, best friends throughout most of their lives. The interesting thing is they had a weird but uh, conflicting relationship with they love to one-up each other. And so when doing so, whenever one always had something to say, the other one always had to say something to top. The other one had a story to tell, the other one always had another thing to say. One caught a fish, the other one, I caught a fish bigger than that. And so day after day, time after time, every time they would talk about each other, they always wanted to one-up one another. Well, one day they were sitting on that porch and the topic came up of the things of God. It started talking about the Bible and talking about different things within the Word of God. And one said, well, yeah, I remember, I believe David did this. The other one said, well, I remember when David did this. Well, I got saved when I was this old. I got saved when I was this old. Well, my church used to sing this. My church sang that. And so they kept going round and round, and one of them had enough, and he finally stood up off of that rocking chair and said, look, you act like you know so much about the Word of God. You act like you're so religious. I bet you $50. You can't even recite the Lord's Prayer. $50? Yeah, $50, I said $50, I said it. So the other one stood up, turned around, looked him square in his eyes, squared his shoulders, and said, Lord, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep, that if I should die before I wake, and he stuck out his hand and said, I pray the Lord, my soul to take. The other man looked at him, disgusted as he could be, stood up, reached in his wallet, took out a $50 bill and said, well, shoot, I didn't think he knew. <laughs> that went over some of y'all's head. <laughs> but the reality is, before we laugh too quickly, some of y'all gonna get that on the way home. <laughs> before we laugh too quickly, we, like those two old gentlemen, sometimes have a distorted view of prayer. Right. We, we don't really struggle about who we pray to. We know that. That's why we're at church. If you've been to church twice, you know who you pray to. And why we pray, again, we have needs, though that's not the only reason we should pray, but we know why to pray. The thing we oftentimes struggle with is how to pray. The how is what causes us problems. And so how is complicated even more when life's trials and tribulations hit us, when things aren't going the way we would want, when things seemingly falling apart at our most fragile times, how we pray becomes increasingly important. With it being that important, the question remains, how should we best pray? Yeah. But again, time after time, when life circumstances happen, we tend to want to cower back. We start to lose our confidence, lose our self-control, lose our hope, lose our joy. Uh, some of us go as far as to even lose our very mind. Yeah. But at the same time, if the word of God says we shouldn't, one thing God says we should never lose yeah. is hope. Again, losing hope is uh, feeling like you're losing out, you're giving up, giving in, going forth. One thing God says we should never do is give up. Yeah. Give up or lose hope. And so through that, our goal today is to look a little bit further against the book of Luke and see what God has to say about giving up and or giving out. Should we do it? If not, how do we pray ourselves out of a situation such as that? And so we go to the book of Luke, and if you go ahead and look there with me, Luke is a unique gospel. 
We look at the Gospels and all the portraits. There are four distinct portraits of Jesus Christ. You have the Gospel of Matthew, which shows Jesus from a Jewish perspective. They're trying to prove that Jesus is the Messiah from the Old Testament that the Old Passage Scriptures talked about. That's yeah. Matthew. When you look at Mark, Mark is a Gospel of action. It talks about Jesus, a lot about what he did. You'll see a lot in their hand then and then and then. It moves relatively quickly as it is the shortest gospel. Skipping over Luke, we go to John. John is a gospel that its purpose is written at the very end of the chapter. It says to show that this is Jesus was the Son of God. But Luke, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Luke is the longest gospel, and Luke seeks to show the humanity of Jesus. In other words, his interactions with people. It shows a lot about how his interactions were with the poor and outcasts. It talks a lot about his parables and miracles. And so through that today, we find ourselves in the middle of what's called the travel narrative. All right. uh, Luke 9.51, it says Jesus turned his face to begin the trip towards Calvary. And the crazy thing about it is he spent most of his early ministry in Galilee. And he's traveling to Jerusalem now to be crucified and ultimately stay on the cross uh, for our benefit, our behalf, and to die in our place. But the interesting thing is he never went straight from Galilee to Jerusalem. He took a wretched and rounded course all through the lands and through Samaria and things of that nature. And so through that, he did a lot of teaching and healing and doing stuff like that on the way there. And so he taught the disciples to pray on the way. That's where we get the Lord's Prayer from. He did a bunch of other things. And then when we get to Luke 18, all of a sudden, he does something interesting. He, he, he introduces two people, a judge and a widow. And he begins to tell a story about how it is important that they not lose hope. We'll yeah. find out why a little bit later in the message. But he introduces, like I said, two people, a judge and a widow. And so verse 1 says, now he was telling them a parable to show them at all times they should pray and not lose heart. Now before I can even get beyond that, if you don't listen to anything I say for the next 15 minutes, we'll be in here. If you get that, if you get verse 1, that's the main idea of the message. So those of y'all that stayed up late last night, if you go to sleep, you heard verse 1, you have everything that you need to know. Do not lose heart, keep praying. Always pray, not give up. Always pray doesn't mean time and every second of every day, but it means in every circumstance, we ought to pray. But again, verse 2, Jesus goes as far as to say, verse 2, in saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. Judges of this day were trusted to settle disputes and handle matters in small areas of the, of the region. Yeah. And so the crazy thing about these judges is that oftentimes there was no governing body. Nobody was keeping them honest. Right. And so what judges would do was they would base their judgments based off mutual benefit. In other words, if you own the store and I need what's at your store, it would be in my best interest to judge based to where you can win because I could benefit on the back end of it. All right. These judges were, in many cases, crooked, evil, self-serving, narcissistic, focused on themselves, and if you didn't have nothing, it's likely you wouldn't go get the verdict in one of their judgments. And so this judge was just one who just did not really care about folks. And the crazy, the even crazier thing is he was an ignorant fool. Now you say, Javon, that's mean, why would you call him an ignorant fool? Well, the Bible says there was a judge who did not fear God. Proverbs 1, 7 says the beginning of wisdom is the what? Fear of God. If he didn't fear God, he couldn't have wisdom. If he didn't have wisdom, there's no way he could understand how to judge accordingly. Therefore, he was an uninformed fool. Okay? And so the judge has no means by which to argue or do anything with wisdom. And I stand here before you today saying some of you guys have some judges in your lives. Yeah. I can think of one in particular uh, who uh, is very narcissistic, very uh, incompassionate, not caring about the thoughts of others. I'm not going to tell you his name, but he lives on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, not caring about the needs and the wants and desires of others. It's all about what's in it for himself. But then it goes even further. It says not only was he a judge who did not fear God, but he also didn't respect man. That's just a nice way of saying he didn't care what you thought about it. So not only was he evil, crazy, not caring about other folks, but also he didn't care that you knew that he was like that. This judge was in a bad position. And again, some of you right now might be uh, aware of some judges. My hope is that you're not one. My hope is that you're not sitting by one. But there's some judges in our lives. 
that only seek to better themselves by the benefiting off of the negligence of handling of, of other people and the way they right. handle others. Right. And so again, I say right now, if you don't hear anything else, don't, don't be a judge. But then it, no sooner than the judge is introduced, yeah. we're introduced to another person in this parable, yeah. a widow. Yeah. Again, no two other are mentioned, no two are needed, only this judge and this widow. The widow, on the other hand, in this society was in a compromised position. Yeah. You see, widows in this day were the lowest of the totem pole. It was them and then orphans. If you were a widow or an orphan, you didn't have much say about anything. And because you were a widow, it meant in this patriarchal society, you didn't have representation. Right. You likely didn't have resources. Nor did you have any means to get what you needed or what you wanted. You were literally always taken advantage of because people knew you didn't have nothing. Yeah. And because you didn't have anything, you were always at the bottom. That's a sad place to be, particularly because in this nation, in this area or this region, the widow had nothing and she knew she had a need in a petition. Well, how will I get that? I know the judges are messed up. I can't do this. How do I go about getting what I need? I believe there's some widows in the room today as well. Your, your husband may, may not have passed away or you may have not experienced loss, but life has dealt you a hand that you don't know what to do with. You seem like you're always at the disposal of others and others control your very existence. And even if such, you're not even put there by a circumstance of your own. Yeah. You were thrust here and by your being here, what can you do about it? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you today that there are some things that you can do. In fact, this widow does something extraordinary. She gives us the prototype of what it looks like to be in a helpless and hopeless situation, but make your petition known to the God of eternity past on how to get what you need and how to get what you want through the word of God. Now this widow uh, all of a sudden goes and approaches this judge. And in her approaching the judge, she's not praying to him. Again, it's a parable. It's used to reveal truth through Jesus' words. Uh, she goes to the judge, and I feel that there's some things we can learn from her as it relates to how to approach God when we have requests that we need as well. And so the first thing I think we can learn from this widow is that she went consistently. Everybody say consistently. Consistently means in every case or on every occasion, invariably. In other words, consistent prayer and petition should never be a foreign concept, but rather the first option, response, and action in the life of a believer. Amen. You ought to be praying. Amen. You should be praying. You better be praying. Amen. Consistent <laughs> prayer is a must and it's necessary to get what we need Amen. from God. Yes. Uh, well, you may say right now, well, Jamal, how, how you know that she was consistently praying? I don't see consistent <laughs> anywhere in there. Look at the text. Verse 3 said, there was a widow in that city and she did what? kept coming to him. It didn't say she went to him once. It says she kept coming to him. It doesn't say how many times, but what we don't know with certainty is that he, she kept coming and saying, give me legal protection from my adversary. She kept going. It wasn't a thing that she did once or twice. In her keeping coming, something started to happen. Uh, for those of you that go to a gym, uh, if you go to a gym, you're doing one of three things. You're either uh, doing some cardio or something, you're lifting weights, or you're standing around looking at everybody else doing one of those two things. Am I right? And so when you're in the gym, if you go just once, you're really not doing that. You're just going inconsistently. You don't build up strength. You don't build up endurance by going to the gym once every other week. You build up endurance by going to the gym frequently and consistently. And what you start to notice is the more you go, the stronger you get. The farther you can run. The more you can do. And but again, you're building up strength. And so in the same way when we pray, when we pray consistently, you start to build strength. Yes. You start to be able to endure whatever situations you're in and you can stand them and you can go with them in consistency because you know God hears you when you call. So again, the, the widow teaches us to pray consistently and through her consistent prayer, we know we should do our, her persistent petition. We know that we can pray consistently and know that God hears us when we call. And so again, like I said, we're going to move quickly because I really only have three things. The widow learned and knew to go ask on her petition, I mean, consistently. But then the next thing she learned to do was she knew she had to go persistently. Come on, man. Persistent. Now again, I say consistently, you like your mind, you're just trying to find some words around. No, no, not at all. Look at the text. 
I, you, can't, you can argue with me, you can't argue with the text. Look at, uh, basically, persistently. The definition means continuing firmly or obstinately in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. Yes, in other sir. words, keeping going even when stuff doesn't look favorable yes, to you. Yes, sir. Persistent prayer shows a dependence on God to hear your faintest cry. Yeah. Y'all know the old folks yes, say he'll sir. answer yes, by sir. and by. Yeah, yeah. And come through irrespective, irrespective of the circumstance or hardship. The widow went persistently. How do I know? Look at the text. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. It said, for a while he was unwilling. Yeah. For a while he was unwilling. Uh, in other words, every time this judge got up, yeah. he put on his, his robe, he'd look at Good Morning America, he'd get in his car and he'd head to Starbucks. And when he got to Starbucks, guess who was there? Yeah. The widow. Give me justice from my adversary. Yeah. He, no, like, leave me alone. He'd leave Starbucks. He'd go and stop at the donut shop. Yeah. You don't need no donuts. It went to Krispy Kreme. He stopped there and tried to get some donuts. And the lady was there. Give me justice from my adversary. No, I'm not doing it. He'd make his way downtown and get to the courthouse and say, uh, let me get out and park my car. Y'all know I'm being facetious, but y'all should get the point. He'd get to the courthouse, and when he got there, waiting there for him was a widow. Give me justice from my adversary. She was persistent. The more he said no, the more she felt empowered to continue asking him to give him what give her what he needed. So persistence is an interesting concept. It's continuing to go in spite or irrespective of your circumstance. Now here's where it gets a little uh, funny. That's why you need to read your Bible and look at it for what it is. Look, look at this guy, uh, and he's talking about himself. Yeah. He's literally self-reflecting. He says, for a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself. Even though I don't fear God or respect man, that's a narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. He's focusing on himself, what he looks like, and his own well-being. He said, look, not only do I not care about God, not only am I a fool, not only am I ignorant and, and, and can't make a wise decision, and also I don't care that other people think about it, but then he goes as far as to say, yet because this widow bothers me. And I'm going to stop right there. Uh, persistently is a, is, a, is a strong word. Uh, Florence Chadwick knew a little bit about going persistently. Uh, she was a 1950s swimmer. She liked to distance swim, and she liked to try to set records for her persistence in doing some of these endeavors. Yeah. And so one time, I think it was 1954, Florence Chadwick decided she was going to swim from Catalina Island, which is a small island off the coast of, coast of California, yeah. and swim to the shore. And so what she did was she had all the news reporters and everybody out there. Uh, she had uh, uh, other experts that knew the waters, and she had boats following her. And one of the boats right beside her was her mother. Her mother's job was simply to encourage her on the route to swimming to Catalina Island. Mind you, this was a 26-mile swim. All right. And so as she dived in the water, she swam, and she was doing well, and she swam and was doing well. They were encouraging her. They were pushing her. The more she swam, uh, the further they went, and they got out in the middle of the Pacific, and then all of a sudden, a dense fog fell over the water. Right. So now, not only is she swimming, she can't see what she's swimming, but she knows she needs to swim in a certain direction. Yeah. So she swam and swam and swam, and, and all of a sudden, she started to get fatigued. Her, her legs got tired, her arms got weary, and all of a sudden, she started saying, I can't do it anymore, I can't go any further. Her mom kept saying, swim, Florence, swim. She yeah. said she couldn't do it any more, and then after about 20 minutes, she finally quit and said, I can't do it anymore. They pulled her out and put her into the boat. Yeah. Relieved a little bit, but disappointed at the same time, she started to think, guys, well, let me sit back and reflect on this for this 30 to 40 minute ride back to the shore. But then all of a sudden, that 30 to 40 minute ride was actually only two to three minutes. Uh -huh. See, what Florence didn't realize is that she was almost at the shore. She was literally less than a quarter mile from her destination, but because she was looking at her circumstance, she opted not to persist. Now, again, I said she could teach us about what it looks like to not persist, but she could also teach us about persistence because, again, then, another year or two later, she decided to do the same feat, and that same fall came down. But what she realized this time is all I need to do is remember what that shore felt like. Yeah. Remember what it looked like to be almost to my destination. And even when I feel I can't swim anymore, I need to keep swimming. Yeah, yeah. Keep pushing. Yeah. 
keep going. And so as that fog rolled in again, she kept swimming and eventually she met her destination. All we're trying to say, Crossover, is that through persistence, you need to keep going irrespective of what your circumstance looks like. Keep praying no matter what it looks like, no matter how far off you think that you are, your persistence in prayer gives you what's called long suffering. Long suffering simply means in any given situation, you can be patient in that situation, knowing that God will come through and that your deliverance is around the bend. A pastor once taught me when I was going through something in life, he said, sometimes you need to learn to be comfortable in the uncertainty of God. Sometimes you have to understand that even not knowing what it's going to look like and what it's going to turn out to be, I need to learn to be comfortable and know that God hears my cry and be persistent in prayer because he hears me and he's going to come through and show me what needs to be done. What a word. And so again, we were talking about praying consistently. That helps, that helps you build up strength. We're talking about praying, I mean, consistently helps you build up strength. Persistently helps you build up long suffering. But last and most importantly, and like I said, I didn't have much, I'm almost done. Again, lastly, the widow shows us the importance of praying expecting. Everybody say expecting. Now you're saying now, okay, Jermon, I, I saw consistently that was in the kept. I almost saw consistently, I mean, I almost saw persistently, and you said that's because he was unwilling. Okay, I said that too, but I sure don't see where it says expectantly. She went to him expectantly. Well, I beg to differ. Let's look at the definition. Expectantly means the state of thinking that something, especially something pleasant or favorable, will happen or will be the case. In other words, praying with faith and expectancy shows belief in the character and loving kindness of God and dependence on him to come through with what his word promises. In other words, knowing he'll do it. Why? Because he said that he would. Knowing that he'll do it because he said that he would. I I know a little bit about expectancy. Uh, My cousin is sitting over here and I can't look at her because she always gets me shook up whenever I talk about this. But uh, I remember leaving a fertility clinic. My wife and I were trying to have a child and things just weren't going as they should have gone. Come on. And so after about a year or two, we figured, you know what, now we'll go to the specialist and hopefully through them, something can give and all of a sudden we can have a child of our own. We go to this fertility specialist and I'll never forget the meeting with this doctor. He started talking, he was talking fast and he sounded good, but all of a sudden everything went south when he said, you know, you do this, you do this, and, and, and I'll make the baby. Now that ain't sound right to me in the first place. But then, at the end of the conversation, he goes along to say, without my help, without my help, without his help. He didn't say God, he said, without my help, you have basically a 0% chance of getting pregnant on your own. With my help, through an expensive procedure, you have about a 5 to 7% chance. So that's better than zero. But again, right now, yeah, there's not much you can do. Uh, thank you. Uh, the checkout is up there, and they'll tell you how much you need to pay for this consultation. I'll never forget leaving. Jacqueline was going back to work. I was going back to work. And so thrown off by this conversation, I went the wrong freeway because I just needed some time for myself. Yeah, yeah. And so when that, I got in the car, and I, I turned on some Israel. Y'all know what you're trying to do when you turn on some Israel when you drive. What you trying to do? You're trying to break down. Yeah. Couldn't cry. Yeah. I said, well, Israel ain't going to get married. I need to do some, some, some smoke, you know, smoking normal. He'll, he'll definitely get you there. Turn on smoking, nothing. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't let go of the fact that God had already told me, Jermon, you're going to have a child. Well, maybe uh, he's going to be through some other means or something of that nature. But again, I ended up making it back to work. Couldn't, couldn't even shed a tear. Went back about my day, and I'll never forget, later that week, I was in H-E-B. <laughs> Y'all know we all in H-E-B every week. Yeah, yeah. Too much money anyway. uh, I'm in H-E-B and then all of a sudden uh, I go through the produce aisle, go through the back and all of a sudden as I'm walking to check out the quiet voice of God say, go down that baby aisle and I go down the baby aisle and as I'm looking I'm like guys this is, this is, this is, this is it has me feeling some sort of way and you see, you see that box of diapers right there not, not, the, not the store brand yeah. not loves, I want you to get some hugs and so I bought a box of diapers yeah. Foolish as it sounds. Box of diapers. No, but the yeah. doctor said, no, no, buy some diapers. I bought yeah. some diapers. I got home before Jacqueline got home. I wrapped them in a plastic bag and put them in the attic. Yeah. Forgot about them. Two and a half years passes, and all of a sudden, we get word just through 
natural means, all of a sudden, Jack is about to have a baby. What am I saying? The expectancy of what I knew God said to be true came to pass. I'll never forget we had a baby shower for her, and I didn't have a car with a bow on it. I didn't have no chain uh, thing to give her a push present or anything like that, but I had a box of diapers. And as I threw tears in my eyes talked to her, I said, and everybody else there, the people here, they can witness it. I said, God told me we would have a baby before, even when everybody else said no. God said yes with expectancy. I bought these diapers. And now we're going to use them. Now, you know, I wanted to mem uh, you know, commemorate and have that box of diapers we never opened. And Joe has ran through them diapers probably the first two, two or three weeks that we had. But in any instance, the expectancy of God, expectancy through prayer, we need to learn to go to God and pray knowing that his word promises that he'll come through. And so with expectancy, how do I know that it was there? Because it says, I will give her legal protection, otherwise by continually coming. Yeah. She'll wear me out. In other words, ain't no quitting me, but it's sure to be quitting this lady. Yeah. If yeah. I don't give in, she's going to wear me out. She's going to yeah. keep coming. She's going to keep pushing. She's going to keep yeah. bothering me. So let me go ahead and give in. Yeah. So that when everything comes to pass, I can go about my business and she can go about hers, please, that I came through for her. Yeah. And so then Jesus looks to close the message again. On, he teaches us through the widow we pray consistently, yeah. Yeah. persistently, and expectantly. But then, like I said, Jesus looks to close the message, yes. uh, and he finishes with this passage, and I like this, yes. uh, because we as believers can understand that timely it's deliverance good. is on it's the way. Good. Consistently, persistently, and expectantly, Jesus starts to talk. Yes. Now, he's told this story. He's already given you the point of the story at the beginning, but at the end, he said, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Yes. says, now will God not bring justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? I ask you, will he delay long over them? In other words, he puts the judge and God on the scale. Yeah. Now on the scale, he's not comparing them. He's not saying God is like an evil judge who wants you to beg him until he gives in. That's not the point of the story. If you think that's it, I need you to hear this right now. He's not saying God wants you to wear him out through prayer. But what he's saying is that if a nasty, low-down, sorry, mean, and evil judge can give in to what his children request, how much more will a loving God who has your best interest, who wants what's good for you, give in to what you're asking him for? How much more will God do that? And then, here's where God, he gets funny. He says, now will God not bring justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? Before the disciples had an opportunity to say anything stupid, he answered the question for them. I tell you that he will what? He will bring about justice for them quickly. He will bring justice for them quickly. Everybody say will. Will. He will provide justice for them quickly. But here's the deal. Within his will. Yes. He will but it's within his will. Yes. What does that mean? I, I've learned through prayer that prayer tends to change you. Yes, it Th does. This is why you need to keep praying. Yes, it does. Because again, through prayer, it doesn't mean when you pray, you're going to get everything that you want. But through your prayers, you'll start to realize that God is slowly changing you. Yes. And so the more you pray, the more you start to feel different about yourself. You grow up a little bit. Yes. You get stronger. You get more yes. mature. He begins to change you. And so after he's done changing you, through the process of him changing you, he starts to change your prayer. Yeah, yeah. Because again, you praying outside of the will of God is foolish prayer. You need to pray for he want, what he wants for you. That's why he says, thy will be done. In other words, pray for what your will is, not for mine. And so again, he changes you, he changes your prayers, and then you continue to pray because you know if you're praying within his will, he won't deny and can't deny you anything. Yeah. So that's when you begin to stop praying for your 98-year-old grandmother to keep living and not pass. Well, look, maybe his will is for her to go ahead and come home to him. And then through the funeral, somebody who don't know him can get saved. You need to pray within his will. Sometimes his will isn't for you to get out of that situation until you've grown up in an area. Sometimes his will is not for you to keep moving. Sometimes it's for you to stop. And the more you keep trying to go, he's trying to tell you stop to understand there's something I need you to get right here. So again, the quickly part of it, it says, I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. Don't look at that too fast. Quickly doesn't mean in a fast amount of time. It basically means at the right time. So again, quickly doesn't mean he's going to bring you out as soon as you pray. It's not gone. It means at the right time, what's best for you, he'll bring you out. There's a quote by the great theologian Charles Haddon Spurgeon that says, if any other circumstance were better for you than the situation you find yourself in right now, Divine love would have placed you there. 
In other words, the divine love of our Creator will put you in the best situation for you. If you're in a storm right now, if you're in a bad spot, guess what? This might be the best place for you until you can learn what God has for you to learn. Okay? So again, I tell you, he will bring justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Uh, it, it's good to know that God will come through. Yeah. All I need you to know is to pray consistently, persistently, and expectantly. Yeah. And expectantly, and you know that God will come through when his time is right. Uh, I know this to be the case. Because I know God hears me when I call. Yeah. Now, that story I told you about a little earlier, that, that handsome young gentleman there, not the one in the back, the one in the front. <laughs> That's my boy, Joe. I love my brother. All right, now. And the Bible says, the Lord inclines the ear to hear your supplications and will respond when you call. That Psalm 116 says, when his children pray, God inclines his ear. In other words, he's listening actively to hear what you're trying to say. Right. But again, I love my son. He's a good boy. Uh, he's active, but he's a good boy. And so, as much as I love Joe, as much as I love him, he's in there wreaking havoc in the nursery right now. Uh, he, he does good things. He, you know, when we pray at the end, he'll say, Amen. And, you know, he, he's smart. He's intelligent. I, I tell people all the time, a lot of times you'll never really appreciate some of the stories in the Bible until you have one of your own. Yeah. I can't relate to what Abraham did. I thought I could, but once I had Joe, I can't relate to what Abraham did. Yeah. I, I can't relate to some of those stories now because I love him so much. But at the innermost core of who he is, he loves me, but he loves Jack. He, he, he's a mama's boy to the core. And so what we try to do is introduce that consistency to his lifestyle. So ever since he's a baby, he's been sleeping in his own room. But because he's so active, he likes to get up and move around. And so every once and again, Jacqueline's going to put him to sleep. And so she goes and takes him to his room, reads a story, says his prayer. Uh, some nights it's me, look again, other times it's her. And she puts him in the bed, but on every once in a while, he doesn't want to go to bed. So he cries and screams and yells, and through his tears, he's just going crazy. She'll come back to our room, and we're in there, and you know, he needs to learn. You know, it's self-soothing is what they call it. That's what yeah. the mother's name, that's what y'all call it, self-soothing. Yeah. And so he's self-soothing himself, but he's crying and screaming. But inevitably, every once in a while, through his tears, he'll say, Dad, Dad. All right, all right, come on. He's crying, but in the midst of his tears, he Working. says, Dad, Dad. Now, Dad, Dad ain't mom. Dad, Dad ain't nobody else. I know when he's saying Dad, Dad he's talking to me. And so all of a sudden, the more he cries, the more he says that, I think he's figured me out. Jacqueline will give me that look, and I said, no, Jacqueline, this is what you don't understand. He's crying. He doesn't like the situation he's in, but he called my name. And because he called my name, I can't leave him in the situation that he's in. I got to go get him. So I'll leave the room to your room. I don't care. I go to Joe's room. And there he is crying, and as soon as he sees me, he lifts his hand up and says, Dad, and stops crying. Yes, now, here's the beauty of the situation. I know him, and I know him better than he knows himself. Yeah. What he doesn't know is that he's just like his mom. Yeah. If she don't get her rest and he don't get his rest, it's a force to be reckoned with in the morning. Yeah. So as much as I want to take him out of the situation, I know what's best for him. He can't come out of that crib because, again, otherwise he, he's going to be a wreck the next day. Yeah. So what I do is instead of taking him out, I hold him, I let him know I'm here, I put him back in the bed and I said, look, I'm not going to leave you. Yeah. I'm going to sit in the bed, I sit in the chair beside the bed. You need to go yeah. back to sleep. All I'm trying to say, Crossover, is I think God works a little bit like that. He works just like that. And sometimes you're in the situation, you want to get out, but it takes God to say, no, you can't come out right now, I need you where you need to be. But until then, I'll be right here with you. He was with Daniel in the lion's den. He was with the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. He'll be with you there. But here's the good part of the story. I'll stay there until he goes to sleep. And he realizes, yeah, it must be best for me to stay here. But in the morning, he may call my name again. Now then it's at the right time. He's had his rest. And no sooner Jack won't be trying to get up there because everybody likes to see him in the morning because he's happy. Now you stay right here. I'm going to get you. And so I'll go get Joe. And then he's saying, Dad, again. And this time, no, I can take you where you want to go because now it's the right time. Again, crossover. all I'm trying to say is that God works just like that. 
He hears you when you call. He knows what you're going through. And through that, he'll deliver you every single time. So your question now is, well, if that's the case, is God going to come through in my situation? What is the answer to that? Yes. Yes. Does God know what I'm going through? The answer is yes. yes. Does God hear me when I call? Yes. Yes. Well, when is he going to come through? You know what the answer to that is? Yes. Yes. When is he going to come through? Yes. Well, who is it going to be? Yes. Well, where is the deliverance going to come from? Yes. God is a yes God, and he is faithful to come through every single time, so long as you're praying within his will. So again, all I need you to understand is to is understand the importance of praying consistently, persistently, and expectantly, and know that God will come through every single time. Somebody in here may want to give up today. You may have feeling that your prayers are not where they should be and you don't feel like anything's going to happen. All you need to do is understand that God is a yes God. He's willing to answer whatever his children pray. And through that, we just need to rely on and wait on him as only we can. Because again, what what else are you going to do? You're going to sit up, be stressed out, losing weight, uh, losing your appetite because you're worried about something? No, become comfortable in the uncertainty of God and understand He's doing what's best for you. Yeah. Now, the good news about this, is this message is one for his elect. Jesus says it right there. How much more will he come through for those who call on yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's for those that believe. Yeah. So if you believe, he's yeah. faithful to do exactly what you've asked for him to do. Yeah. Believe in the fact that he died for your sins, was yeah. buried and raised three days later. And through that, you have forgiveness of sins. Yes, sir. Period. Yes, sir. And through that, you know that you're on the winning side. The battle's already been fought. The battle is already won. You're on the good side. Do what God has called you to do. But remember that you need to pray persistently, consistently, and like that widow did, pray expectantly and knowing that the God of the universe, the God that died on the cross for us, and the God who was there and said, let there be light, knows you, knows the hairs on your head, knows what you're going through. And it's faithful to come through every single time because his answer is always going to be a what? Yes. yes. But the yes is for his will, not yes. yours. Amen. Let's pray. Yes. Gracious God, our Father, Lord, we come to you. Thank you. Yes, Lord, right now, Lord, just for your word, God, help us to understand no matter the circumstance, God, no matter whatever we're going through, Lord, to count it all joy. God, help us to hear uh, your voice, God. Sometimes it's in the loud resounding sounds of other things. Other times it's a soft, quiet whisper, God, but help us to discern when you're telling us to go. And when you tell us to go, God, help us to go. When you tell us to stay, God, help us to stay. When you say wait, God, help us to know to wait. Again, God, your yes is not our yes. Your yes is your yes. And through that, God, we know that you want what's best for us, you love us, you incline your ear to hear our every petition and our every call. And through that, Lord, we're just thankful. Thankful, thankful that you are who you say that you are. A God that will come and supply our every need, God, according to your will. So help us to grow in that. God, if there's someone here today, God, who doesn't know you and the part of their sin, God, help them to understand and believe that for the first time today.